All right, so I'd like to introduce you to our presenters. We have Amy Cross. Um, she's a project manager for the National Pesticide Information Center, worked closely with state, tribal, federal, and other partners to deliver pesticide safety education nationwide. We also have uh, Diana Sims, is the Pesticide Medical Education Director of PerkMed. PerkMed is a cooperative agreement between the US EPA, the University of California, Davis, and Oregon State University. All right, so without further ado, I am gonna go ahead and turn the table over to Amy so that she will be able to start our presentation. All right, so you should be seeing my slides. How does that look, Jamie? Okay, all right. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Um, I'll be speaking first and then Diana will be um, joining. And I'm the project coordinator of the National Pesticide Information Center, which I'll be referring to as NPIC, just because it's an easier name than our, our long one. I've been the project coordinator there for about uh, five years. I've been with the center for about eight years. Um, so what I hope to do today is to dispel some of the myths and misinformation that may be quite common from your patients or from others, even within the medical industry. Um, these are really basic things that some of us might think of as common sense. Um, so I'll, I'll look at some differences between common products. We'll talk just very briefly about what the heck this list end thing is, if you aren't already familiar. We'll talk about some basic basic precautions that are useful knowing about all of that misinformation that has been out there. And then I'll touch on some less common topics just very briefly because they have the potential to be much larger exposure scenarios that you could potentially uh, come in contact with or that you might encounter. Um, and then Diana will be talking about healthcare provider reporting requirements as well as some resources for both providers and patients. Um, so like I said, I'm with the National Pesticide Information Center, and we are an EPA-funded center, so it's actually a cooperative agreement, which means that we're based at Oregon State University, and our goal is to provide unbiased pesticide information. So this is useful for you to know because we are a resource um, if you have patients that are asking questions about whether dif different disinfectant products or pesticides for that matter are quote unquote safe. That's kind of what we do. We, we do risk communication in and around pesticides and disinfectants. So you're welcome to use us as a resource in that way. I'll also talk about how you personally can use us as a resource. Um, so, so our experts are, although we're science communicators, we're scientists first and foremost. So there might be a variety of reasons why it would be helpful for you to call us. We provide support to providers that may be treating patients. Um, if you have questions about, um, let's say you're gonna be doing some kind of a testing situation to determine any kind of exposure, we may be able to help you find in the literature information about metabolites um, or things to verify testing information. Um, we might be able to help you look up information about excretion, typical excretion times, or those typical symptoms that someone with an exposure to a particular ingredient might be experiencing. It's very important that I specify here that we don't have any medical training. We also don't have legal or regulatory advice that we provide either, but um, poison control would be the go-to if a provider was looking for treatment advice. With very few exceptions, the resources that we have and are available, available to provide are not medical advice. And Diana later will talk about one very popular resource, it's called the Recognition and Management of Pesticide Poisonings. That's one exception where we have access to that document and it's an EPA document about pesticide poisonings. Um, and so it may provide some treatment advice that we are not providing individually. So another thing that we, we can offer is patient education materials. These are materials that are typically geared towards the general public we understand that that requires a variety of messaging types, everything from more technical fact sheets to easily accessible and colorful infographics. All of our materials are written at an eighth grade reading level or lower. 
because we acknowledge that that can be a significant barrier to education is, is just reading level. So we take really complex topics about pesticides and we distill them down. Um, these may be useful to have on hand um, or if you're looking for various patient education materials. So let's talk about some of those common products that there's a lot of misinformation about. Um, I'll talk about three similar but very different categories. When uh, a patient you know, is thinking about using a product, if they're going to the store, if they're wanting to be very fastidious and do their due diligence in order to control some kind of a virus or a germ on surfaces, they may pick up something and not necessarily know what that product is claiming to do. There's three different kinds of general products out there. One is just the general cleaners. Okay, these cleaners are identifiable because they say things like whitens, removes grimes or odors, it just says cleans on the label, but it doesn't specify anything about controlling a bacteria or a virus or any other kind of um, you know, microbe. Now there's a sanitizer, which is a stronger level up. These are products that are specifically tested to ensure that they control the bacteria that they claim to control on the label. So these, this is the first category of EPA registered pesticide as a disinfectant, or not as a disinfectant, but as an antimicrobial. So there's two kinds of antimicrobials. There's sanitizers and then there's disinfectants. And we're really focusing on disinfectants because of COVID. Disinfectants can control either bacteria or viruses, but really they're the only ones that can control viruses. Now that's not to say that soap and water or cleaners um, aren't also useful because those can, remove germs, including viruses, from surfaces, but the disinfectants are actually controlling them. They're actually breaking down the virus or quote unquote killing it. Now the problem with going to the store and picking up a disinfectant is that a lot of folks don't know that not all disinfectants are the same and each product may only control a very finite list and can only control them based on the very specific instructions that are given on that label. And so what can happen then is you can have, um, you can have various patients that might use a product that worked for a very specific situation and use it all over. So you can have situations where you have um, overuse of a product, which can lead to higher exposure potentials. Um, and then you can also have that lead to not actually being effective in their situation and then still having some kind of some type of potential health negative health outcome from that. Um, so this is another really common misconception is the similarity between some of the names between those products that are EPA pesticides and those products that are FDA regulated um, like hand sanitizers. Now that word sanitizer is appearing in, in both a type of antimicrobial and also those FDA regulated antiseptic products. And so the difference here is where can it be used? No sanitizer or disinfectant, none of the EPA registered types can be used on people. They are all for surfaces only. And so if it mentions using it on a surface on the label, then it, can't, it, it also cannot be used as a hand sanitizer. I think that that is something that a lot of people get confused about, especially let's say we've got a canister of wipes um, at a school and the students are picking those up and using them on their desk. We'll talk later why students shouldn't be using wipes. But um, if they're then also cleaning their hands off or using it to wipe their face, that is directly exposing them to a pesticide ingredient, which we'll talk later also about how there can be a lot of eye and skin irritation associated with those kinds of things. So that's the very basic difference between the antimicrobials that are considered pesticides um, and the hand sanitizers, which are antiseptics regulated by the FDA. So very briefly, I want to touch on this list N. Anytime you go to a CDC website or anywhere else that's talking about controlling for COVID and other viruses, there is typically some kind of a recommendation that if you're dealing with a, an individual who has become sick and you're trying to clean the premises, that um, using a disinfectant that's on list N is one of the steps that's provided. So list N is actually a, a very, it's like 600 products long at this point. It's a list of disinfectants that are expected to control the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 virus on surfaces. Now the reason that this was so essential in the beginning 
of 2020 is because none of the product labels listed that they actually could control that specific virus because they hadn't been tested for it at that point. And remember I said that each of the product labels for disinfectants have a finite list of viruses for which they've been tested and that their efficacy has been shown. And so what this list N has done is it's used a couple of different um, ways to basically come up with this comprehensive, well, it's not comprehensive, it's growing every day actually, but it's a pretty long list. It's about 600 products long. So this is in order to try to protect human health. There's this list of products that are expected to, for one reason or another, um, control the COVID-19 virus on surfaces. So I expect that this is something you could very easily search for. If you were to just do like a Google search online, but if you have any questions while looking at this list, you can either um, look through all the Q and A's that EPA has on their website, or you can also call us and we can step you through it. Um, sometimes I know that patients are asking for products that are lower in toxicity. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now on this list, and there are um, over a dozen, maybe 20 or more different possible active ingredients that are doing the virus control. This is just a smattering. This is just a selection of active ingredients that may be more common. Some of them are the most common, some of them are not. Um, and I just wanted to show you the variety of precautions that are likely going to be showing up on these labels because of some of the potential health impacts. So a lot of the various disinfectant active ingredients on this list and others can be considered asthmogens. Now, asthmogen is typically referring to an environment in which you know, they're, they're looking at occupational exposures, people who have repeated exposures over time. But if you have, let's say, a home exposure with repeated exposures over time, that can also lead to potential sensitivity, um, inhalation sensitivity. And so with the quaternary ammonium compounds, this one is probably one of the hardest categories. It is over 200, maybe closer to 300 of the total 600 products. So it's really a popular or common ingredient to see on the label, but you're not always going to see the same name because there are dozens of technical chemical names that fit under this category of quaternary ammonium compounds. So this is just two examples. Um, you know, we might refer to them as ADVAC or DDAC, but when you're looking at the full chemical name, a lot of times that's what's printed on the bottle or on the label of the product. Um, and they are generally referred to as quaternary ammonium compounds or quats. And so um, these can have severe skin burns and eye damage. They can also be toxic if swallowed and can be considered asthmogens. Now there are others like hydrogen peroxide that are lower in toxicity in general, but they can still cause severe eye burns and eye damage um, as well as skin damage. I think sodium hypochlorite or bleach is a pretty well-known active ingredient. Um, peroxyacetic acid or paracetic acid is something that is considered lower in toxicity via the oral route, but it is actually, um, it, it's quite um, harmful still, even though it's considered one of the lower toxicity ingredients. So I'll talk about that on the next slide. Citric acid also, it's going to be considered one of the lower toxicity ingredients, but it still has some pretty severe irritation. Um, what I want you to take away from this slide is not specific ingredients necessarily, but that a lot of them are eye and skin and inhalation irritants, um, but then also it can matter by which route of exposure someone's exposed for these disinfectants. Um, so this next list, notice how it has parasitic acid on there and citric acid as well. Um, this is a list of quote unquote safer chemicals ingredients list. This is a list EPA created because it has been evaluated and it is considered quote unquote safer than traditional chemical ingredients. We tend not to use those words safer. We tend to talk about it in terms of risk, but just because something is lower in toxicity does not mean that it has no toxicity. Um, like I talked about before, citric acid can be very harmful to the eyes. Parasitic acid has a lot of other harmful if inhaled and in, in other exposure routes. So um, take this all with a grain of salt that it depends more about the exposure in some instances with some active ingredients than it does about the ingredient itself. Um, because I wouldn't necessarily call any of these safe. They're all pesticide ingredients and they're all designed to kill those viruses. So they're all going to be considered lower toxicity, but risk is made up of toxicity and exposure, keeping that in mind. Okay, so some of the precautions. Um, this is a, a short list that I came up with that 
we were hearing, we run this hotline to answer these free pesticide questions um, from the public mostly or from professionals. And these questions kept coming back and back about disinfectants and wipes. And so I thought that this might be helpful in case your patients are asking some of the same questions. Um, they may see a phrase that says, keep out of reach of children on the container, or you may see that. As far as I can tell, um, there isn't necessarily a unified regulatory um, definition of this. There might be on a state or city or local level, but in terms of best practices, keep out of reach of children typically means no one under age 18. But that's not necessarily, like I said, regulatory in nature. That's a best practice in terms of pesticide safety education. Um, there is a big difference between these disinfectant wipes and skin wipes or baby wipes. And we have stories from specialists working at our own center where their family members use disinfectant wipes accidentally on skin as a baby wipe. Um, and so kind of knowing that everybody really does have a canister of these just about in their homes or maybe not may, may not realize that they're in a lot of our families' homes or our friends' homes um, or also in the workplace and can be you know, brought in by others um, from outside. This is also something where you know, a lot of times they're ending up on the lists that kids have to bring in of school supplies into the classroom. And um, knowing that they're not for skin and that kids are not necessarily gonna know that could potentially lead to several skin exposures uh, over and above what would be expected normally. Some of these can be used for food contact surfaces. It all depends on what's on the label. But where this really is interesting to me is that, again, with this, the kids having them be brought to school, um, they may be using them on their desks, which their desks may also become where they're having lunch. Because of COVID, several classrooms uh, or a lot of schools are not using the cafeterias as much. They might be using individual classrooms. And if the desk becomes a food contact surface, essentially, because when you set down a plate of food, especially when you're talking about kids at school, um, you know, that sandwich might leave that plate or those chips might leave that plate and land on that surface. And using some of these wipes on that surface, you've now got a disinfectant in those areas. Um, and so that's a potential exposure route that a lot of people really are just not considering. Um, also, a lot of the products do ask for you to wash your hands after use, even if it doesn't ask on the, say on the label to do that, that's a best practice um, to rinse those residues off the hands. Um, and then in, in terms of efficacy, because these wipes dry out as you continue using them, um, they're not necessarily going to actually be effective like they're designed to do, not actually control the virus. And so what I'm gonna talk about is contact time. Um, that is a part of the label that individuals need to follow in order for it to work. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, I do want to talk about some of the risks of home remedies. You know, when folks see that there are these potential risks for disinfectant ingredients and um, they become potentially alarmed, they think, oh, well, I can use something that I've gotten in around the home. But one of the riskiest outcomes is that two cleaning products are accidentally mixed that really shouldn't be and there are a variety of different ingredients that should not be mixed together. Um, I'll call attention to the last one on this list, hydrogen peroxide and vinegar creating parasitic acid and we already talked about how this parasitic or peroxyacetic acid can have some uh, you know various potential negative health outcomes from exposures um, in addition to some of the very toxic gases that can be created. Also, these, um, you know, mixing up your own products at home or using things that aren't intended for disinfecting, they really don't have any instructions on how to mix it. And so overuse could be one concern. Also, they don't have any first aid instructions. Typically, they don't provide any guidance for protective clothing and they're not tested for efficacy. So there might not actually be any control of the virus on surfaces or not enough to make it worthwhile. Um, bleach is a big question because it's available, it's affordable, a lot of people already have it in home. There is some mixing and dilution guidance, but there are some precautions as well to look into. Um, if I'm looking at a bleach product that says it's for viruses, it's going to have instructions on there that are different than just a regular bleach product that I'd use for laundry. There really aren't going to be any mixing instructions or dilution instructions. We don't have any of the same precautionary information. It's just not required on that whitening bleach. 
And it may have additives like sensor gels that change not only the efficacy, but also food safety. So if they were used on surfaces where food was gonna be used later, that can increase risks. And then also because this is something a lot of us have in our homes already, um, our individual familiarities can lead to less vigilance over time, which can increase exposure scenarios. Now, um, as providers, you may encounter overly fastidious patients. So there are a couple of points here I wanted to call out um, that you could be mindful of. One is that masks cannot be disinfected. So disinfection, remember I'm using it as a very specific term. It is using these chemical disinfectants to control the virus. Um, you know, the cleaning chemicals of any kind really should not be used on masks, but there are no products for home use of mask disinfection. It increases risks both to skin exposure and then also to airway exposure. Um, and a second point I'd like to bring up is that disinfectants have no place on food. And there might be some products for food contact surfaces, but they also often require pre-cleaning of the surface to make it effective and or rinsing with clean potable water after the disinfectant is used. And you can imagine that an overly fastidious patient could potentially um, be adding a lot more residue onto their surfaces if they're doing this regularly or if they're doing it onto the surfaces where their food is going to contact, not taking the care to either pre-clean or rinse those areas. And so this might be something that um, these two situations in particular can increase risk for those that are doing constant cleaning. Okay, so I said I would talk about contact time. Contact time, if, um, if there's any part of the label that explains efficacy, it is this contact time. What it means is the amount of time a surface has to stay visibly wet with the disinfectant. So uh, a lot of times, especially with cleaners or just soap and water, you know, we're spraying a surface, wiping it off after and walking away. That's not how disinfectants work. And so what this does is it leaves a residue on the surface sometimes for 30 seconds on purpose or up to five minutes where the surface is wet with disinfectant to be effective. So let's say that an individual is following this protocol and they are leaving the surfaces wet. It does leave for higher potential of other people accidentally coming into contact with the disinfectant. Um, you know, we hear stories about door handles being disinfectant and left wet to dry, air dry, and then others coming along and using those door handles not knowing why they're wet especially in a workplace environment where um, you know, the workers are dealing with these disinfectants day in and day out. The purpose is for these surfaces to stay wet, and so they have greater potential to be coming into contact with these wet surfaces throughout the day. Okay, so a, co a couple less common topics. Um, one of them is to talk about electrostatic sprayers, also misters and foggers. So these are apparatuses that are going to distribute very, very fine particles of the disinfectant over surfaces. And um, depending on how they work, they might be designed to help the disinfectant um, charge and stay onto a surface better, um, or just create a more even coat. These application methods, unless they're specifically on the label, they're not necessarily evaluated by EPA as safe or effective, but they're not necessarily um, disallowed. They may not be recommended by EPA unless the label says that specifically. However, there is a lot of popularity around the ease in which you can apply these products into large spaces. So you can imagine, you know, although it's not specifically prohibited by some labels, if um, an individual or worker were to have a product, a disinfectant liquid that they're then using into these large distribution um, apparatuses like a mister, that, that potential exposure for inhalation, skin exposure, eye exposure, Exposure, all of those things um, goes up a lot. And so we have larger exposure scenarios possible from these foggers, misters, and electrostatic sprayers, depending on a lot of times the field in which the person may be working. Um, this can occur in schools, this can occur in um, you know, airports or, or airplanes, um, as well as medical facilities. And so this is something just to be on the lookout for, for large exposure scenarios. Um, another is actually UV light. So UV light itself is not considered a disinfectant. It is not registered as a disinfectant. It's not a substance. Um, 
and it's not going to have anything to do with the list N that we talked about. So these UV light machines, um, there could be other things that, that kill viruses that are not a substance. UV light, um, it could be the production of ozone, there could be air purifiers. These are typically referred to as pesticide devices because they are some sort of apparatus or contrivance that are meant to kill and destroy viruses or other germs. Um, and so these specific examples are not going to be evaluated by EPA for their safety or efficacy before their use. And so they have something that it's not the same process that a disinfectant is going to go through and there might be a lot of unknowns as to the actual risks of these products. Okay, and with that, I will let Diana take over. Great, can you hear me okay? Yep. Thanks, Amy. Um, great information. Uh, my name is Diana Sims, and I am the Pesticide Medical Education Director for Perk Med, as introduced previously. Um, and what I wanted to talk to you about today is applying some of the great knowledge that Amy just shared with us and how we can make ourselves useful and be a resource to you as clinicians practicing out in the real world, in addition to the services that NPEC provides that Amy had described earlier. Next slide, please. There we go. So our mission at PerkMed is to help healthcare providers such as yourselves prevent, recognize, and treat pesticide-related health conditions through education resources and technical assistance. I'll give you some examples of those as we go through. So one thing, um, as all of you are probably keenly aware, is that typically pesticide is not routinely included or exposures to pesticides are how those manifest in, in, in patient scenarios. That's not something that's routinely included in healthcare provider training or education. So there's a knowledge gap. Um, some of the other challenges with talking about this subject matter are that the symptoms are often nonspecific and can be attributed quite easily to other diagnoses. And then providers also are not trained necessarily to recognize these specific types of exposures or to think in their differential diagnosis about what may be underlying um, some of these symptoms that are walking into the office. Um, and I'll give you some examples of of occupational exposure groups. So um, what the, you see on the screen in front of you now is um, a map that PerkMed developed um, looking at what are the reporting requirements for healthcare providers. About 64% of states, which you see in the dark green on this map here, do require, do have mandatory pesticide reporting requirements for healthcare providers sometimes for labs and for hospitals or other healthcare facilities. And so the map that you see in front of you is an interactive clickable map. Um, and we're just gonna take uh, where Amy and I are based in Oregon as an example. If you were to click on the state, beautiful state of Oregon, go to the next slide, please. A provider could see that uh, Oregon is indeed a mandatory reporting state um, and exposures need to be reported within uh, 24 hours. And then there's a link to where those um, reporting uh, agencies are on the far right-hand tab. So again, about 64% of states, um, I'm feeling that most of you are probably in the Oregon, Washington, Pacific Northwest area. And um, so it, it, it's good to be aware of what these reporting requirements are. Next slide, please. So how can we be of service to all of you? So some of the things that Perk Med does is we provide free continuing medical education opportunities, CME, like what we're doing here today. Um, I'll show you some examples of online, more in-depth uh, courses that we offer and support as well. So we facilitate uh, free CME opportunities. Um, and as Amy was describing earlier, and pick answers the phone when you call. So there's a hotline that's operated Monday through Friday that Amy directs uh, with all of the uh, science communicators as, at NPIC. And then you can also reach out to us specifically at PerkMed and we return your email um, or call as well. We provide subject matter expertise and support and the resources that you may need when you're caring for patients with potential pesticide exposure, including those kind of unusual uh, scenarios that um, 
sometimes do come into the NPIC hotline from providers um, describing these uh, bizarre scenarios. Another thing that PerkMed does is that we network with local and national experts to support you with these challenging encounters. So we partner with, for example, the American Academy of Family Physicians, American Academy of uh, Physician Assistants, different types of national organizations where providers might be going uh, to get those just-in-time resources. We have a partnership um, that's under development too with different nursing organizations to um, amplify the message and the educational pieces. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to turn to now is just kind of the nuts and bolts, some of the practical resources that you can find on our website, which includes some of the information that uh, Amy had shared earlier that have these infographic style handouts that are really amenable to using as patient education resources. Uh, so the example that you see in front of you is one of the partnerships we developed was with APHN, the Association for Public Health Nurses, and we were really thrilled to be able to incorporate information about pesticide exposures into their new to public health uh, nurse residency training program and get that on the radar of those who are going to be um, new in the field working and um, primarily doing home visiting and, and uh, doing frontline public health work as well. So that's one of the examples of our partnerships. Uh, next slide, please, Amy. One thing that we did early on is to, in fact, uh, what you see in front of you is an, a brief um, newsletter article that we worked with um, uh, the Northwest Primary Care Association to, to make that link between what, what in the world do pesticides, you know, most people think immediately about uh, an aerial applicator flying over a big crop and uh, and um, uh, dropping herbicides. And so what we wanted to do is make kind of the big aha moment is what do pesticides have to do with this thing that we were calling SARS-CoV-2, um, what we all now commonly right, know as COVID-19. So what do pesticides have to do with this? And many people were surprised to learn that the infection control products that are used so incredibly widely in hospital settings, in healthcare settings, in classrooms, um, that those are actually pesticides as Amy just educated us about. So this is just an example of working with a, a primary care and community clinic system to get this information out to providers. Next slide, please. This is an example of a partnership with the California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. And we developed an online CM free CME course um, that can be taken by practitioners both in California or anywhere across the country um, and provides um, basic information and more in-depth toxicology information as well for those who really are interested and want to get, in, get into the toxicology piece um, and the chemical of the chemicals that are uh, active ingredients in pesticides. So this is an example of one of the partnerships where we facilitate free CME. Next slide, please. Some additional resources Amy had mentioned, and I'll have my colleague Rebecca, who's um, with us here today, post this in the chat, please. Um, the, in the upper right-hand corner, what you see is um, basically the pesticide Bible for providers. It's called the Recognition and Management of Pesticide Poisonings in the upper right-hand corner. And that is the, um, there. it's linked on our PerkMed website, as well as on Amy's um, NPIC website, where it's got very specific um, uh, treatment uh, and symptomatology charts where you can look up what's going on and what are the side effects and look at the latest um, information about that. So that is a, an important clinical resource that I would make you aware of today um, to access that. Um, and also if there's any interest, sometimes people do like to have hard copies of it, so if there's an interest from anyone on the webinar today, you can feel free to reach out to me and I can get a hard copy of, of that book sent to you, that manual. Um, so in addition to the, rec the RMPP is what we call it for short. In addition to that important resource, and um, we also have different case studies that are included on our website, looking at everything from um, Lindane, which is a, a lice uh, uh, treatment um, that can be used and it was an overexposure case scenario looking at um, aerial application or oversprays different things like that 
that really presented in real life cases and um, are incredibly useful in terms of a teaching tool. So we're continuing to make those available um, for resources on our PerkMed website. Um, and then we also are really pushing um, and excited about uh, new collaboration opportunities um, that we call our Champion Network, and I'll go into that in just a second. Um, but we provide technical assistance through our advisory board and through our PerkMed team as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of um, a collaboration with the Northwest uh, PASHU, or the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit, and it's part of an infographic that was developed and led by Dr. Catherine Carr at the University of Washington um, and her colleagues there. Um, and what we did is um, took, these are for pediatric uh, specific uh, signs and symptoms for pesticide toxicity. We have one that's about acute um, and chronic exposures that's on our website. Um, so using an infographic style approach to looking at what are some of the signs and symptoms that providers should be aware of, um, their skin irritation, the eyes, cardiac symptoms, dizziness, neurology, and respiratory issues. As Amy was mentioning earlier, some of these products that are so incredibly uh, widely used in the disinfectant category um, do tend to uh, potentially produce asthmatic symptoms. Um, and so there's been an increase in the use of um, these types of products and, and symptoms that is that are coming into different healthcare facilities. So this infographic um, just is a quick snapshot of what you might be looking for as a provider of something that's coming uh, into your office or clinic or other type of setting. Next slide, please. And again, this is just uh, to reinforce the most comprehensive source um, that provides consensus recommendations on how to recognize and treat pesticide poisonings is this uh, book, the RMPP. Next slide, please. Um, so what I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about today is what are some of the future directions that Perk Med um, is headed um, so I had mentioned about our work with national healthcare provider organizations, such as the American Academy of Family Physicians, National Nurse Led Care Consortium, and other places. You can probably hear my dogs growling in the background. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, um, uh, so we have a, a great interest in working with regional um, provider organizations as well. So since people on this uh, webinar are coming from the Oregon Pacific area, we'd be interested in um, providing uh, through our champion program, um, additional educational and outreach opportunities within your regional networks here in the, in the Pacific Northwest. So if anybody's interested in having a presentation done by a clinician, for example, um, feel free to reach out to me and um, I would be happy to uh, connect our resources to you to do um, more specific uh, training and awareness in this area. Um, so I think uh, Rebecca is going to post that as well. I don't have um, the presenter control right now, but if you look on our uh, PerkMed website, um, you can find a link to our, you know, help us schedule a speaker type of thing for this champion program. Um, if you're interested as well in um, specific topic areas, uh, one of um, that, that might be uh, more broad than looking beyond uh, just disinfectants, but looking at um, insecticides and other types of things that your patient population may be encountering, I encourage you to contact me. And um, We often think about, um, you know, the vast majority of, of pesticide um, usage occurs in the agricultural industry, about 90%. But what ends up happening is that so many other occupational groups are often overlooked. So as we're focused here today, specifically on disinfectants, some of the occupational groups that would be at increased risk of pesticide overexposure include those working in the hospitality industry, those working in restaurants, so the people who are cleaning office buildings um, at night after uh, the building is empty, people who are working in hotels and exposed um, constantly and who might not be have access to the appropriate 
um, PPE that needs to be worn when applying these disinfectants or who might um, not have the resources that they need, um, or there could be language barriers or educational barriers in terms of providing um, access to the right types of information or the right types of PPE, or even access to hand washing, for example. Um, so some of the other occupational groups that could be at risk, we always want to encourage people to think that in addition to those um, uh, populations that are working in the agriculture industry, that also at risk can be those working in forestry, um, in fishing, um, in construction trades, um, and in healthcare. As one of the slides that I love that Amy showed earlier was with the um, was what looked like a patient care room and the disinfectant uh, being aerosolized into the room, and thinking about how long um, a room like that would need to be empty and who's going in to clean it, and then just the different real life scenarios that could happen. And so one of the things that we like to always um, try to do is think about how do these big concepts and big ideas really translate into what you as a provider are seeing in front of you, what's coming into your urgent care clinic, what's coming into your um, primary care facility, what's coming right in front of you that and help think about ways to integrate screening um, for these types of exposures when you're looking at different occupational classes. If you have a family where um, mom or dad are working in the fields and maybe the oldest um, uh, multi-generational family living in one house and you have other family members um, who might be contributing to take-home exposures. So if there are pesticides that are clinging, to, uh, residues clinging to um, a person's clothes or to their shoes, and then they are um, coming into the household and there are small children who are crawling and using right the typical hand to mouth behavior of a, of a young child. Um, and now the clothing and the boots have just been worn and, uh, and over the surfaces where there have been potential um, residues of pesticide clinging to those different work um, uh, work pieces of clothing. Uh, I think last next slide, please, Amy. This should be the last one. Um, I want to be aware of time since we have about 10 minutes and see if there's any questions. Um, if you have any um, needs or interest in collaborating with PerkMed or interest in having a, a clinician to clinician webinar, I'd encourage you to reach out to me here on my email, dr. Sims, S I M M E S, I U C Davis. Um, and I'm hoping that um, you can all see the, I can't see the chat box as I'm presenting, but that Rebecca's populating some of the resources I've been talking about here. And I think we're at the very last, the next slide, Amy. There's one more. I think that's it. I'll let you talk about that one about the hours just, more specifically. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what Dinah was saying about, um, you know, we're, we're here for you if you have questions. So um, I think that when a provider is encountering a situation with pesticides, you, you know, you're not necessarily going to know exactly where to go to. Um, but if you can remember that there are resources out there like Perk Med and NPIC to help you find the appropriate treatment information. Um, or other resources that are available for education and things like that, then I hope that that will be um, a useful tool in your toolbox.